Lydia was a 13-year-old child who went to London to see Hairspray the musical. In the beginning, everything was normal, however, she then became incredibly thirsty. Although she started to drink high amounts of water, her lips became dry. In the same year, she became more and more exhausted and tired while feeling constant thirst. She dismissed the symptoms for quite a while, but on a holiday, she lost a lot of weight while eating high amounts of food. Her parents were alarmed and made an appointment with a doctor. After finding high levels of glucose in her blood, it became clear that Luda is one of the 336 million people worldwide who suffer from diabetes. You can find the full story in the description, but how does diabetes work and more importantly, how can we cure it? My name is Kim Steinig and today we talk about how we might use stem cells to cure type 1 diabetes. Diabetes is one of the oldest diseases known to man. It was first reported in Egyptian manuscripts over 3000 years ago. We can distinguish between different types of diabetes, mainly type 1, type 2, gestational, cystic fibrosis and monogenic diabetes. Of course, these subcategories are quite different in their underlying causes, but they all share common symptoms. The story we've heard included a girl who experienced the classical symptoms of type 1 diabetes. She suffered from extreme hunger and thirst while having to urinate frequently. She lost a lot of weight and was extremely tired. Besides these symptoms, further warning signs of diabetes are numbness in hands and feet, blurred vision or breath odor. Broadly speaking, all of these symptoms are directly or indirectly caused by a state of hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. Okay, so why do diabetes patients have high levels of glucose in the blood? The key word here is insulin. As you might have heard, insulin is a peptide hormone which is produced by beta cells in the pancreas. Every time we eat some burgers, the nutrients are broken down and absorbed in our digestive tract. As a consequence, blood glucose levels are increased and this is registered by beta cells which now secrete insulin. Since insulin is a hormone, it has different effects on our body, but for us the most important functions are the stimulation of glucose uptake and the suppression of gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is a process in which the body produces its own glucose. And this process is now disturbed in diabetes patients. So let's now take a closer look on type 1 diabetes and then on type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes develops more frequently in people younger than 30 and therefore it is also called juvenile onset diabetes. Similar to most other human diseases, type 1 diabetes is not caused by mutations in single genes, but environmental and genetic factors play an important role. There is more and more evidence that incidences increase in the developed world, but are quite rare in the developing world. But why do people suffer from type 1 diabetes? The underlying cause of type 1 diabetes is the destruction of insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas. And this destruction is provoked by immune cells, mainly by T cells and macrophages. As a consequence, the insulin production is reduced and then eliminated, leading to high blood glucose levels. So the pathology of type 1 diabetes similar to Alzheimer's, atherosclerosis or multiple sclerosis involves an overreactive immune system. And this is the theme of a lot of diseases. Although the immune system is vital for our body, its dysfunction can cause a lot of damage. But for now, let's continue with type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is the most common form of diabetes and it's also caused by different environmental and genetic factors. Here, especially physical inactivity, cigarette smoking and drinking high amounts of alcohol can provoke the disease. However, although we mostly talk about the association between obesity and developing type 2 diabetes, there are also strong genetic factors. I think this is quite astonishing, but twin studies have revealed that a monozygotic twin has nearly a 100% chance to develop diabetes if the other twin has the disease. If you want to learn more about twin studies, we've covered them in this episode. A very important distinction between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes are the underlying causes of the respective disease. While type 1 diabetes is mostly caused by the destruction of beta cells by immune cells, type 2 diabetes is caused by insulin insensitivity. This means that insulin is produced in type 2 diabetes patients, but it fails to act properly. There are several reasons why this might happen, but broadly speaking, the body becomes resistant against insulin, the production of insulin decreases and beta cells die eventually. Since the causes of type 1 diabetes are different from the causes of type 2 diabetes, cures for one type of diabetes will probably not work on the other form. But we can for example try to restore the production of insulin in type 1 diabetes patients. 
This will lead to a more efficient uptake of glucose from the bloodstream, which will then cure the disease. Since type 2 diabetes is often caused by insulin resistance, however, this approach will probably not work here. For now, we'll focus on potential cures for type 1 diabetes. And finally, after 7 episodes, we can talk about stem cell therapies. But for now, very briefly. Stem cells are special cells we find in our body which can divide and differentiate in an unlimited manner. Differentiation means that stem cells can give rise to different cell types such as muscles, neurons or skin cells. For instance, hematopoietic stem cells, which are found in a bone marrow, can become different kinds of immune cells, red blood cells or blood platelets. But stem cells are found in different parts of our body throughout our whole life. And this starts after fertilization, when stem cells arise, divide and gradually become each cell type we know. In adults we find less stem cells, but they still have crucial roles. They are the reason why our gut epithelium is completely renewed every 48 hours. In our intestine alone, over 200 grams of epithelium cells are produced every day. Over the last years, we've developed different techniques to produce and differentiate stem cells in a laboratory. This means, for example, that we can produce beta cells using stem cells and transplant them into type 1 diabetes patients in order to restore insulin production. This sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it has already been done. In 2008, marine embryonic stem cells were differentiated into insulin-producing cells, which are then transplanted into diabetic mice. Here the cells respond to high glucose levels by secreting insulin. And in this manner, blood glucose levels were restored quite well. But we face several long-term challenges in regard to transplanting insulin-secreting cells. First of all, there is always the possibility that transplanted cells, tissues or organs are rejected by the recipient, especially if the cells derive from another organism. If we transplant cells from a donor who is genetically dissimilar from the recipient, then we call this an allergenic transplantation. In this case, the immune system often recognizes these genetic differences and thinks that the transplanted cells are infected cells or pathogens. As a result, the immune system starts to attack the transplanted cells and destroys them. In order to avoid this destruction, we can use immunosuppressive drugs or genetically modified cells prior to transplantation. However, even if your cells, which directly derive from the recipient itself, we face another major challenge. We have discussed that type 1 diabetes involves the destruction of beta cells by immune cells. So why shouldn't the same immune cells also destroy the transplants? This is a real issue and it means that we need to protect our transplanted cells from immune cells. A Californian company named Viasite developed a marker device in which we find insulin-producing cells. In principle, the marker device allows the secretion of insulin by insulin-producing cells while protecting them from immune cells. Currently, a clinical phase 1, phase 2 trial assesses the functionality of the device. We will see how effective this device is, but for now, let's talk about further challenges. Another major challenge is safety. Of course, we need to be very careful if we use cells which were differentiated in vitro. Since these cells might still have the ability to divide in an unlimited fashion, they might give rise to what we call teratomas. Teratomas are cancer-like aggregations which are formed when the transplanted cells divide rapidly. We need to develop further protocols and conduct further studies in order to minimize this risk. Last but not least, there are of course also ethical issues if we want to differentiate human embryonic stem cells into insulin-producing cells. To obtain embryonic stem cells, the embryo has to be sacrificed most of the times. This is the reason why there are strict regulations in the usage of human embryonic stem cells in most countries. We could overcome this issue by creating stem cells from already differentiated cells, but we'll talk about this in another video. If you're interested in these or similar topics, let me know in the comment section and leave a like. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button in order to stay informed about the greatest discoveries in life sciences. And with that, I'll see ya.